Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us on our weekly AJA Zoom event, and uh, welcome to any new people that may be joining us for the first time this week. Welcome also to those people from any of our communal organisations who may be watching, and we hope you enjoy the session. We also have people watching on Facebook and some who listen to the audio replay, which is broadcast every Thursday at midday and Sundays at 4 p.m. on J Air Community Radio. Uh, that's at FM 88 in Melbourne or at j-air.com.au everywhere else. So welcome to you all. My name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association. Uh, also visible on your screens are David Adler, President of the AJA, and Michael Bird, my former co-host of Nothing Left on, on J Air, who will also be participating tonight. Our guest tonight is David L. Bernstein, um, and the topic uh, of discussion is Woke Anti-Semitism, which is the title of his book that's uh, due out soon. We're going to have a bit of a, an interview uh, and discussion with David first for about 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, if you're not familiar with our format, what we ask you to do is raise your hand electronically uh, and that lets us know that you want to ask a question because we need to give you the option to unmute yourself. The way to raise your hand electroni electronically is in the reactions icon down at the bottom of the screen. You can uh, put written questions up on the chat function and Robert Gregory, our Director of Public Affairs, will read some of them out during question time. And of course, if you don't like the chat function, that can always be disabled. Okay, although we may uh, think of it as a very recent innovation, apparently the term woke first came into use back in the early 1960s and is defined as being acutely aware of issues of racial and social justice. In other words, a person who has woken up to, so to social justice, uh, and this is where we might all roll our eyes. The use of the word re reached mainstream vernacular when the Black Lives Matter movement used the hashtag stay woke, hash stay woke, following the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, by police in 2014. The Jewish world is certainly not immune to woke concepts, but it was interesting to see that the title of a new book about to be launched is called Woke Anti-Semitism. I suspect that we all have a vague idea of what this means, but to tell us exactly how wokeness can impact on anti-Semitism in the Jewish world, we are delighted to have its author, David Bernstein, with us today. David is in Washington, DC, where it is just after 6 a.m. So David, welcome to Australia via the AJA, and thank you for getting uh, up so early for us. For having me, it's wonderful to see you all. Um, David, firstly, could you start by just giving us a little snapshot into your background and, and some of your values? Who is David L. Bernstein? Well, I've been in the Jewish world my entire life. Uh, as a professional, I was uh, the immediate past CEO of an organization called the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, which is an umbrella for the uh, Jewish Community Relations Councils. These are the local Jewish advocacy arms in Jew 125 of them around the United States. Um, and I've um, headed up an organization that taught high school and college students how to advocate for Israel effectively. Um, I was with an organization called the American Jewish Committee, which is a global Jewish advocacy organization. Um, so I've been in this sort of pro-Israel Jewish community my whole life. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a particularly... Um, right-wing guy. I'm actually mostly uh, advocated for sort of center-left policies um, in the Jewish community. Th um, policies like uh, criminal justice reform and immigrant rights and, and so forth. So I've, I'm, I've never been on that side of the political spectrum. Um, but it, but I, for a long time, about 25 years, and I even had um, articles that I wrote back 25 years ago, I've seen the potential of this ideology to sort of metastasize and become a danger for the American Jewish community. Um, and not just the American Jewish community, by the way, I would regard it as a threat to the country itself. I regard it as a threat to the West because I know it's in Anglo countries like Australia, New Zealand, um, UK, and so forth. So I've, I've been watching this happen. And it's really in the last few years when I watched this 
strain of anti-Semitism really go from the background to the foreground. I saw um, colleagues of mine who had embraced this ideology. These are people in the Jewish community, mainstream Jewish community, who um, started to insist that there was only one way to look at the world and that they had it. And, you know, Alan, you, you used the, um, you, you defined the term woke. And I think that was really it. It's the ability to see or think that you can see what no one else can see or others cannot see, which is that there's bias that's deeply embedded in the very systems of society. It's like the air you breathe. But it has one other component to it than just the claim that you can see. It's the idea that only the people who have been negatively affected by it, only the oppressed have the ability to see it. In other words, you can see something if you experience it, but the outsider, the person who's doing the oppressing, may not even be aware that they're doing the oppressing. So you can imagine that this is sometimes the case, right? If you're a Jewish person and you experienced anti-Semitism growing up, you may have some insights about that that a non-Jewish person who might have been in, you know, part of the dominant class might not be aware of, right? So that it does give you some insight at times, but it's not everything. And it doesn't mean that you can then just shove your opinion down everybody else's throats. And that's what's really happened in the past, uh, in the past few years. Um, you know, and I can go into some examples of this in the Jewish community, but maybe I'll stop there. Okay, no, well, we would be very interested in some examples. So just so that we're all, we're all on the same page here, what what actually do you mean by woke anti-Semitism? And is this the same as progressive anti-Semitism? Progressive anti-Semitism, of course, anti-Semitism on the left. We've been aware of that for a long time. And, and people do talk about that. You know, well, we know there's left-wing anti-Semitism um, groups that are established on the American scene, like the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. We'll, we'll talk about anti-Semitism on the left. What they're not doing is connecting the dots between that anti-Semitism on the left and this woke ideology that has been around for the last several years. And, and that's what I mean by it. I mean, it's this very specific strain of anti-Semitism that emerges from, um, from this left-wing woke ideology. So it's no accident, for example, that in May 2021, we saw the hostilities in, the, in Gaza, right, between Israeli, uh, Israelis and Hamas. If you were in the United States, and I imagine it probably wasn't that different in Australia, but you can tell me, the situation, it felt very different in May 2021 than it had in every previous round of the conflict. There had been a conflict in 2018 between Israel and Hamas. There had been a conflict in 2014 and 2010. And we're, we were used to having these rounds every four years with, or every year or two when things would start to heat up. This felt very different. You could see social media went ballistic and we, we treated Israel immediately as not just an aggressor, but as a colonizer. And so when we started to see that, we were like, what the hell happened here? And it wasn't that there was anything different about that particular set of uh, conflict. It was that um, it was that this that the ideological environment in the United States on the left had changed radically. And that was affecting the way people understood Israel and Zionism and the conflict. So that was one of the key uh, wake up calls for a lot of people. But for me, I started to see other uh, signs of this as well. When you see phrases like Jewish privilege being used, it, there was a, there's a hashtag on Twitter, Jewish privilege. Jewish privilege. I mean, I understand what you mean by white privilege. I might not agree with what you mean by white privilege, but when you start seeing tags like Jewish privilege, you know that this is turning, this is this ideology is metastasizing and turning into a kind of anti-Semitism. Let me give you some examples of how that, that can work. Um, at Stanford University, there was this big controversy when a senator at the university, this is a student senator, um, made uh, made comments that he didn't think that uh, saying that the Jews controlled the media was anti-Semitism. And it caused such an uproar that it, eventually he had to resign his post. But during that same debate, there were progressive students that said, well, we do have to understand and acknowledge the intersection between white privilege and Jewish privilege. And those comments went completely unchallenged. So in other words, you couldn't get, you, you couldn't get away with a right-wing canard 
that Jews control the media, control the banks, control whatever. But you could get away with this vague notion, this vague idea of, of, of Jewish privilege. And when you really strip it down, what is Jewish privilege? It's a Jewish, it's a conspiracy theory that Jews have have disproportionate power and are using their power to oppress others. And so I think that's the root of woke anti-Semitism. That's what I mean by woke anti-Semitism. And I can go in deeper. There are other examples as well, of course. Alan, I think you're on mute. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, yes, David. So uh, I, I, how do you go about this in your book? What, what, what is the way you're approaching this? Are you simply going through some of these examples that you're going to, that you're talking about? Or have you come at it from a slightly different way? I start by tracing my own upbringing and um, what I, what I, so I, 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 I talk about um, when I first start to see this in college in America, um, aspects of it. It wasn't a dominant ideology then, but you know, I took a, I took, I took a women's studies class in college. And in that class, um, I, um, there was a, there was a very ideological teacher who shut down any conversation about the topic. And I remember thinking to myself, that's not, this is not education, this is indoctrination. I'm not allowed to actually challenge the professor. So I, I saw, I, I also saw, um, I saw anti-Semitism among sort of the radical black community too. I was a student activist. I was a top pro-Israel activist in college in the 1980s. And, you know, there were, there were, there were radical black figures like Stokely Carmichael and Leonard Jeffries who were traveling around to campus. And it seemed that the people were willing to tolerate what they were saying, you know, no matter how outrageous it was, no matter how ugly it was, people were tolerating it. So I said, well, you know, that's strange. Why is that, why is that being tolerated? Because it comes from the left or becomes from a, 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 a an oppressed group. Um, and then when, then I, you know, I, I, I saw it in the, um, I saw it in the Durban conference in South Africa, as you might recall in 2000, September of 2001, there was a, a horrible uh, spate of anti-Semitism at that conference and anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism. And I thought people didn't understand what was happening. It wasn't that that just came from nowhere. It's that there's that people had embraced this post-colonial ideology that the only reason why some countries are doing better than other countries is that the countries that are doing well, the Western countries, are pressing the countries that are not doing as well. That was the underlying ideology that you saw at Durban. And it was very easy to take that same ideology and then apply it to Israel and the Palestinians. It's my contention that that post-colonial ideology that we saw around 20 some years ago during Durban is the same ideology that's now been sort of imported into the domestic scene in countries like the US and Australia. And they're now applying that oppressor oppressed ideology, that binary ideology to Jews in Israel. So that's where the roots of anti-Semitism come from. And that's how I trace it in the book. I, 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 wanna, I want you to see what I saw and how it developed in the American Jewish community and in the American scene and in the West. And then I bring you to the, to the point where let's talk now about how this manifests itself in various ways. There's a concept um, called equity. Um, now you may have heard, you've heard the word equity. We have, we have equity in our house. Um, it's very, it's used almost interchangeably with the idea of equality. And, but equity means something different. It was written. It was it was written about by Ibram X. Kendi, who is a professor of Boston University, a black professor of Boston University, who says that the that that whenever there's a disparity between groups, blacks, whites, Asians, and the like, whenever there's a disparity, it means that the people who have more have taken from the people who have less. In other words, the, the, the disparity is synonymous with discrimination. There cannot be a difference between group outcomes unless there's discrimination that caused those disparities. No other possible explanation of why some groups do better than other groups. The, that is anti-Semitism waiting to happen because, if, because Jews tend to do well in almost every society they're, that, that they're in. And if you're saying that the only reason why Jews are doing well is because they've done it on the backs of minority groups. You're going to see anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. um, there was a um, there was a Jewish student group at Colorado College 
um, in, in the United States that um, was dismantled because it had more people at its Shabbat services than any other religious group did. At, on, and, and in the name of equity, they said, well, you can't have more, so we're going to, we're going to dismantle the entire spiritual life program at the college. So that just that that gives you an insight into the kind of thinking that's uh, taking place here and how that can cause anti-Semitism. It's still in its early stage. You don't hear a lot of examples of that, but you know that it's that that's now in the ether, and I think that's going to cause problems in the future. And Asian Americans, by the way, who do very well in this country, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, Indian Americans, and the like, they're also feeling the effects of this now as well. Their kids are not getting into college at the same degree or to, to the elite colleges in the way that they were before. And I think that's uh, that poses a real danger to their sense of well-being in this country. Yeah, um, David, I just want to go off on a slight tangent, uh, and we'll come back to all of this. You describe yourself as being on the center left politically, yet what you're talking about doesn't sound to me like it's center left politics. Um, is, is that an inconsistency or are you perhaps shifting your political views a little bit as, as, you're invest, as you've been investigating all of this? In, in, the, in the States, the idea of being on the, the center left, center right, traditionally meant that you had certain views on policy issues. So if you were if you were center left, you tended to believe that there should be universal health care. Like un, unlike a lot of Western democracies, uh, there's not universal health care in the United States. You might have believed that the government shouldn't be in the religion business. There's separation of church and state. So I, I always felt that, that that actually religion did better when the government stayed out. Um, you know, um, I believed in immigrant rights that that uh, that or in immigration. I thought immigration was good for America, and so I didn't want to see efforts to restrict um, too much, overly restrict immigration. Those were the policy issues that I that I believed in, and I still believe in. So I have not changed. What's changed is the people around me who have bought into this ideology. Now there are a lot of other people like me on the sort of center left of American politics, not, um, who are starting to realize what's happened to them with this woke ideological train hitting them. And they're now, um, they're now increasingly, by the way, working closely with the center right, which also feels um, a bit alienated from American politics as well, because they feel that the Republican Party has been taken over by a very aggressive ideological force and that and they're not happy with the direction of sort of Trump and Trumpism in America. So you see people on the center left and the center right who might have been at odds at loggerheads in American discourse now joining forces. And it's almost hard to tell them apart anymore because they're they don't argue about the issues that they used to argue about. They're they're arguing for sort of lib, what you call a small L liberal and democratic values. Yeah, that, that, um, it's very interesting because what you've described in this in this country, so to Australians, um, anybody that describes themselves as centre left are probably more left than than the way you described yourself. So that's why I asked that first question. I don't think um, any of us would have a problem with with those with those values that you just talked about. But in this country, centre left seems to be a little bit further left than. Than, than, uh, than your perspective on. So that's very interesting. Um, I'm going to ask Michael to come in now. Uh, you, do you have a question, Michael? Yeah, I've got two, uh, two questions for you. Uh, it's Michael Bird, David, how are you? Michael, good to see you. Uh, uh, two questions for you, David. <clears throat> this woke uh, ideology has spread like wildfire all around the Western countries. However, what I find intriguing is that the progressive Jewish diasporas, or liberals as you call them, in particular, have uh, appeared to embrace what I call like this cult more than most. Is this a fair observation? And if so, why is that? I think it's, 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 par it's par I'm gonna give you a partial fair on that, Michael. Um, and the reason why partial is that I, there's an awful lot of people who have not embraced it, but either pretend to embrace it or just stay quiet. No one wants to be called a racist. No one wants to be um, unseated from their organization because a mob of people have attacked them. You know, and, and that's really what you're facing. I get more Facebook messages from center-left Jews that say, thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. We, we should have seen this a long time ago. I mean, I can read you one from yesterday. 
I mean, that's how frequent they are. Um, they, you know, it, it, it happens all the time. I had, we, we, we maintain a, a group of Jewish professionals in the American scene, all of whom are center left, by the way, who are very disenchanted and disgruntled by the environment. Many of the top leaders of the Jewish community agree this is a problem, but they're just not willing to take it on because there are board members or donors or others that feel very strongly about these ideas and are trying to establish them within Jewish life as well. Um, you know, this is not some, this is something even the, the wealthiest classes support. It's not like this is coming from some group of people with like, uh, you know, uh, green hair and, and, and the like. This is coming from, uh, from, from well-established people on the American scene, from large corporations are, are using what we call diversity, equity, and inclusion training programs that establish this as the one and only philosophy at the company on diversity. So you remember, so if you're, if you're a wealthy donor, you may have actually been sort of indoctrinated in this yourself and believe that, that it's the only way forward. And so some, that makes it much more challenging. Mm. Um, David, as someone who identifies as center-left, you would be qualified to explain why both American and Australian diaspora have such huge problems with our own Jewish left, what you call liberals and what we call progressives, uh, and what I describe pouring fuel on the fire of anti-Semitism, accepting that most anti-Semitism is being masked as anti-Israelism. I mean, you have the, your, uh, your anti-Zionist J Street and we have the New Israel Fund, both organizations working behind the scenes supporting the Palestinian narrative. In Australia, Progressive New Israel Fund is also lobbying our government to recognize a Palestinian state and lobbying against the IRA definition, definition of anti-Semitism. How do you explain this phenomenon? Look, I mean, I th it, is, it is complicated here. Um, there are, there, there are, you know, we, we have diversity in our own ranks on these issues. I mean, not all, you know, there are Jews who love Israel who also, um, who also believe that Israel should do X, Y, or Z. And they, they um, and, and they're willing to say so publicly. And, um, and that, that's fine. Some of them have gone off the reservation and are arguing that, uh, that unless, that, um, that, you know, Zionism is racism and the Jewish, and, and it's um, wrong that there should be a Jewish state and, and so forth. And we've seen that going, going way back. I mean, even decades. I, I've been to Australia. I was in Australia, I think in 2008. And from with Jewish, uh, young Jews around the United States. I was younger then. Um, and, um, and, you know, you could see that in the, in those groups of young Jews from wherever they came, there were, there were many of them that were very fervent, proud Zionists, nor few that were either non-Zionist or anti-Zionist. It's been around a long time. I think Jews have always, felt, many Jews have always felt safer on the left, and they're willing to conform themselves to the ideological trends on the left to remain in good standing. I think that's probably the the force here at work. That if you're a Jewish person who and you believe ultimately that the left is where you're safer, they're your community, and even if the left is becoming more extreme, you're willing to almost reconcile yourself anything to stay in good stead with these forces. So no matter how crazy the ideology becomes, you're willing to you're willing to say, well, I, I that's what I believe. In, in some ways, it's the, the, I, there's, a, there's a name for this that I use in my book called identitarian deference. And you see this in Jewish organizations and non-Jewish organizations alike. It's once you decide that somebody else has the ability to make the decision about what's right and what's wrong on these issues. Once, the, you, once you say, um, you know, I'm a Jewish person, or I'm a white person. And very often Jews will say, I'm white. I'm a white person. And therefore, I can't, I'm not qualified to tell you what is correct about racism and what's incorrect about racism in this country, because I'm white, now that you, then you hire people, you hire maybe a diversity, equity, inclusion trainer for your organization or, or an HR person, a human resources person, that person now gets to tell you what you think about these issues in your whole organization. And what, what that does is it also poisons your view on everything else. So if, you, if that person now has standing and power 
you might defer to them on other issues as well. You might just start to say, well, in order for me to remain in good in, um, in good standing with them, I'm also going to be influenced by their views on Israelis and Palestinians, for example. So I think that 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 I, that force that's out there of of deference of identitarian deference is very powerful and it's leading many people in the in a very bad direction. Okay, um, we'll go to questions in a moment. So far, and very unusually, I only have one hand up. So now's the time to think of questions. Um, but David, I think you've got uh, a question for David, and then we'll take our little commercial break. Thanks so much, David, for the very interesting um, outline of an issue. Um, I can show you examples if you wish, but um, do you believe there is Jewish anti-Semitism, Jewish woke anti-Semitism, that there are people who um, are on the left of politics who embrace the usual range of woke causes and are actually Jewish anti-Semites? I mean, I tend to call them self-hating Jews, and there certainly exist. Um, you know, Jews are able to, well, can buy into any ideological trend. You know, I try not to focus, like, I don't, I tend not to focus on individuals that much, in, unless I have to illustrate what the problem is. I, I'm very careful about using the A word, about anti-Semitism when it comes to specific people. I want, I want to be, because I, I want it to be so clear that it was actually anti-Semitism when I do that. So I don't, in, a, in the end, participate in the demeaning of the term. That's a, it's a powerful word, and I want to make sure it continues hmm. to have that, that power. So I'll try not to use it unless, I, unless there's no other word that fits the bill. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I do think that there are certainly, there are plenty of Jews that buy into this uh, to, to woke ideology. And some of those Jews also hold attitudes about Israel and Zionism that you could argue would make them um, anti-Semites. I mean, they, they think that, you know, the state of Israel has absolutely no right to exist. There's groups like Jewish Voices for Peace in this, in this country um, that are anti-Zionist and, um, and, um, and are proactively trying to shut out mainstream Jewish organizations from sort of progressive coalitions where they've sort of Insinu insinuated themselves in. So I think that's a kind of anti-Semitism. If you're, if you're a radical leftist Jew who's trying to keep other Jews from participating in a coalition, let's say on gay rights or whatever, you're, acti you're actively participating in an anti-Semitic event. And I think you've seen some of that. Yeah, indeed. Okay, David, let's, uh, okay, so before we go to uh, David, I'll just mention that if you're listening on JAIR, this is the Australian Jewish Association Zoom event, which we have every Wednesday night. Our guest tonight is David L. Bernstein in Washington, D.C., and we're talking about a new book that he's written that's about to be launched that's called Woke Anti-Semitism. We're just going to take a break uh, very quickly for a moment, and uh, our David will tell everybody what's coming up next week. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. I'm going to take one little liberty seeing that uh, our guest mentioned um, Jewish Voices for Peace, and you'll see uh, on your screen now part of their campaign, which they did uh, a couple of years ago dur during Hanukkah, was um, a campaign against Donald Trump. But they've taken a Jewish symbol here, which is the dreidel, and instead of having the usual uh, Neskadol Hayapo or Neskadol Hayasham on the dreidel, they've put BDS and a heart. So this is the organisation that um, David was talking about. Um, and to me, that's an actual attack on Judaism itself. But to go straight to um, Alan's uh, point, as we always do each week, um, we ask people on our events, if you're not yet doing something active to support AJA, once our event is finished, please go to the website jewishassociation.org.au. You can apply for membership. You can join the email list. You can make a donation. Don't forget to uh, like and follow the Facebook page for daily updates on various news and views items. Next week, we have a special event. Um, 
which is a tribute to one of the greatest uh, Australian Jewish communal leaders who died about 18 months ago, uh, Izzy Liebler. Um, we have a couple of members of his family, uh, as well as his biographer, Professor Susan Ruckland, uh, joining us. And uh, we might ask them about uh, uh, how Izzy might have related to this subject of woke anti-Semitism as well. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, I, I've got a feeling I know what Izzy what would have said. Yeah. <laughs> okay, question time. Uh, I've got uh, Leon, Jeff, Rod and Ron. So we'll start with you, Leon. If you unmute yourself, Leon doesn't have a camera, but um, fire, fire away with your question. Good evening, David. Um, is the American, uh, the organised American Jewish community allying itself with other victims or of, of woke racism, uh, such as the Asian commu community in the US, are they allying themselves in order to resist the depredations of wokeism? And um, a supplementary question related to that, um, can one help comparing the attitude of the current woke equity ideology to the Nazi allegation that the Jews were privileged and they were exploiters of the Germans. How much, how um, dangerous do you think to the physical well being of Jews in America is wokeism? Yeah, so, on, on the first question, um, you, you're, you're spot on on that. Um, we, my organization, I created a new organization called the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. It's J-I-L-V. By liberal, in this sense, we mean classical liberal values, which is the free expression of ideas um, and the ability to have open discourse. The, the Jewish uh, comment, uh, the, the Jewish saying would be machloket l'shem shemayim, arguments for the sake of heaven. Um, and um, what we... Um, um, and what we've been doing is building bridges to uh, Black thinkers and Asian thinkers who um, particularly who agree with us on these issues. We have some, we've had some, several um, YouTube videos and shows, and we actually held a conference in New York with 50 top Jewish, Asian, and Black thinkers um, trying to come up with a common strategy for fighting against woke ideology and for building a uh, commitment to what we would call liberal principles of, of freedom and um, against extremism, whether it comes from the far left or the far right. Um, this idea of privilege and equity, I don't think you need to invoke the Nazis. It's, it's, it exists everywhere already. I mean, it's not like, the, you know, that you, you see it on all sides. You see it, you know, the, the Soviets did the same thing. Um, you know, the, the, of course, you saw it in Nazi Germany. You've seen it in uh, Eastern Europe. And um, you see it in, the, the, um, in, in every society around the world. I mean, it's, it's deeply, if you talk about being deeply embedded in the systems of society, this idea that Jews are powerful and are are taking advantage of, of their relationships to power is something that's, you know, the, probably the most well-worn anti-Semitic trope there is. What, what makes this a bit more insidious these days is that it's being couched in progressive language. And progressives now have a permission structure to express that anti-Semitism in a way that people don't readily recognize. So, you know, it's a lot easier to recognize sort of the traditional right-wing variety of anti-Semitism. You know, it tends to sort of hit you over the head. You Jews control everything. You Jews this, you Jews that. You know, it's, it's pretty blatant. Anti-Semitism on the left is better dressed and uh, slicker and harder to put your finger on sometimes. And it hides in anti-Zionism and, and the like. And I think that's um, what, we're, what we're up against here is um, is that is that you know it's a lot easier to talk about Jewish privilege for some reason than it would be about Jewish control over the media, even if the two things are very similar. One is disguised in left wing ideological terminology that has gravitas on the American scene. Thanks, thanks, David. And, and just on that for a moment, we've talked about Jewish privilege a little tonight, and. And if I understand it correctly, and it's a bit like white privilege, simply by being, you could be 
the most uh, brilliant, the most kindest, the most noble, the, the, the most humane person of, uh, in the world. Um, but just by being Jewish, that brings you down a few pegs. Is that, is that what we're meaning by Jewish privilege? What you mean by Jewish privilege is that by passing as white in American society, you took, um, and by being Jewish itself, you've, you've taken advantage of white supremacy. Now, by white supremacy, they don't mean the old definition, which we, you'd say we call the, you know, the KKK or the Ku Klux Klan, the um, white nationalists who go around, you know, with tiki tortures and saying Jews will not replace us. That's not what we, um, what we, we mean, but what they mean by that. They mean a structure in society that dominates people of color. Um, and, and that Jews, because they're white, uh, and because they're Jews, because they have their own network of white supremacy, uh, are using it to, uh, to keep others down. That's what's meant by that idea of Jewish privilege, that you're, because you're a Jew in America, you have very specific privileges that are, that are based on your power. So if you view power automatically as a bad thing, you, you, you view power as ill-begotten then you're, you're likely then to say anybody who has it must have gotten it in a way that was illegitimate. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jeff, uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Shalom, David. I just think that in the context of you mentioning Russia and the Russians and their anti-Semitism, I just want to point out, perhaps you didn't realize, or maybe you did, that progressive, the term progressives was coined around the time of the Stalinist era, a venomous, vomitous hatred of Jews and, and, uh, and Western culture was such that they realized that they wouldn't be able to sell Uncle Joe Stalin to the West. So they coined the phrase progressives to themselves. How about that? Um, so I, I think that, that that that's right. That doesn't mean everybody who calls themselves progressive is a, a Stalinist, but it means that. Um, but it means that that's been around a long time, and it, it tends to mean that Jews from the former Soviet Union pick up on this very readily. The person who wrote the foreword to my book was Natan Sharansky. Um, now Sharansky came to the United States and visits his friends and sees and hears what's happening, and he and and it sounds to him that this woke ideology is very similar to that Soviet ideology that, set, that, 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 that treated uh, the bourgeoisie in a very particular way and believed that they were, that, that they were um, oppressing people of the world. And, um, and so this is a, a scandal to him, a moral scandal that this is gaining ground in the United States. Um, you find that with almost, almost every Soviet Jew I know living in the United States, uh, does not like this ideology at all. Feel very traumatized by it because they. It, it sounds to them like the country they fled to is sounding a lot like the country they fled from. Now, Lahavdil, as we say, in other words, the United States is not the Soviet Union. United States is a democracy. Um, we have problems. No one is being disappeared because they say something that violates woke terms. Being canceled is not the same as being killed in America. So, you know, I, I think we shouldn't, you know, we should sound the alarm bells, but not, but not make the comparison directly. But you can understand why if someone came from a totalitarian country that experienced all of that, that they would then be very nervous about this ideology that they're hearing in the West now. Okay, uh, Rod, your turn. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hi, David. Just wondering um, whether you or how you would see George Soros's involvement in these sorts of issues. Is George involved one way or the other in this? Because some of the stuff I've seen recently about his involvement in law and order issues in the US would seem to me to be quite negative. Does he have a position on the Jews in Israel? George Soros is a progressive activist philanthropist with a lot of money. He's funding, um, you know, many uh, criminal justice efforts and very leftist prosecutors. The, the problem for us is that there are people who are talking about George Soros's involvement on the extreme right in America and are using it as a dog whistle 
for anti-Semitism too. So it's a very touchy issue because on the one hand, you, it's legitimate to say George Soros who's a Jew and a Holocaust survivor is, um, is involved in, uh, in American politics. That is absolutely true. He's a force. He's not the only force. I mean, if he went away, there would still be all of these ideological trends. He's not solely responsible for them, but he's one of the people who funds some of it. Um, but it is also true that there are people on the extreme right who are saying, see what the Jews are doing. They're funding wokeness. I mean, I just, and I think it's very important that we're aware of this. I mean, we're not immune from this from the right. And in, in, in America, at least, the right has, the extreme right has guns as well. And it makes it very dangerous. So, um, you know, when, when I posted about my book on several anti-critical race theory sites on Facebook, on almost every posting, there were anti-Semitic comments that, oh, you Jews created wokeness in the first place, so what are you whining about? I mean, that happened in almost every single situation from right-wingers, and some of them were quite extreme statements. So, you know, there's without a doubt, we have a problem on both sides of the political spectrum, and we have to be aware that, um, you know, that that even as I criticize the left, and, um, and I'm, you know, completely unapologetical in doing so, I know that there's extreme sentiments on the right that are quite dangerous as well, in some cases even more dangerous, because the people who, who ha hold those views may come into my synagogue with a gun and shoot it up, as we've seen. Mm. Uh, thank you. Ron, your turn, and then we'll take some written questions from Robert. Um, hi, good evening, uh, good morning. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you think there are some parallels of um, between um, what's going on in America now with woke and so on, and uh, the America of the early 40s with uh, with um, Stephen Wise and uh, also the early 50s as well. Do you see some parallels as well there? Um, I think American Jews, like any Jewish diaspora, have always done what they have to do in order to uh, maintain their standing and their security. And, and people react in different ways when there's a threat. Some people, double down on trying to conform to the society in the societal institution that's being infected and some people become advocates for the jews who they fear are going to be persecuted so we have all these responses different responses different um, tendencies within the jewish community to either reconcile themselves it's sort of like the fight or flight response and i see we see i think we see both fight and flight within the Jewish community whenever we experience severe anti-Semitism. Um, you know, America today is a pretty, I mean, all said and done, you know, you can you can be Jewish and have a, you know, and and be proudly Jewish and walk around with your big Jewish star. I have a, my, my younger son, Ari, who's 17, decided, you know, he, to wear a kippah to school in his public school. Um, He's, he wears a kippah now, and um, um, and I asked him, you know, how's it, how's that been for you? Are you experiencing anti-Semitism? I'm not really, you know. And so I think it's, this is a pretty pretty tolerant society in general. It's just that these these dark clouds are in the air on uh, ideologically on on the extreme right and uh, certainly on the on the on the extreme left that are um, that are empowering anti-Semites in very specific ways. So I think this is still a, quite a, a, a free country in a lot of ways, but you know, you gotta watch out for this stuff. It can, it can all of a sudden it ceases to, all of a sudden maybe you can't wear a keeper in school anymore. Mm, thank you. Robert, uh, you've got some written questions that you want to ask? Yeah, so um, on that, those dark clouds, so we've seen on university campuses growing anti-Semitism and we've seen, especially in Brooklyn and parts of New York, attacks on Jews and the, the growth of the squad and some of these things, are newer they weren't this bad 10 years ago so what are your thoughts on the long-term future of jews in america do you think it goes the way of france and even parts of england or do you think things are gonna turn out all right you know it's hard to say to me the, the, the fate of american jews is linked to the fate of liberalism and the, uh, the idea of freedom in society if, if society gets torn apart and um and, and that's not good for the jews in other words, the more the more um, ideologically extreme this country becomes, the more divided it becomes, the more that there are authoritarian tendencies that come up um, that that manifest themselves in politics, the more the Jewish community 
is at risk. So the question, so the question is, if I'm uh, if I'm an optimist or pessimist, it really is more a question about America than it is about anti-Semitism. I mean, anti-Semitism always comes out in extreme ideological times, and and that's certainly the case in the United States. So um, you know, yes, there are some dark clouds. You mentioned a few of them. They're not all the same, by the way. They don't all come from the same place. I mean, what you've seen in Brooklyn is I don't think that woke anti-Semitism, um, you know, where, where a, uh, let's say, uh, somebody from the inner city black community goes and out of resentment beats up a Hasidic Jew, which, by the way, happened in the 1990s, I mean, in, the, in Crown Heights. So it's not like that's not new. It might, be, it might happen more at certain times than at other times. It's also, by the way, happened to a lot of Asians very recently as well. So I don't think that, um, that that's um, a new phenomenon. Um, on, um, but, um, but, you know, and I don't think it's woke anti-Semitism, but I do think that as the right, if, if, the, if the left becomes crazy, then the right becomes crazy. And it's like a vicious cycle in American politics. And if that vicious cycle doesn't get disrupted by rational people, if rational people cannot find their voice, if people who want to go back to some semblance of, of normalcy in American politics cannot push their extremes to the margins, then I think it's going to be very rough on American Jews, and some American Jews may feel uncomfortable, increasingly uncomfortable. I mean, you know, we've always thought that the Corbynization of American politics, of the American left, is possible. By Corbynization, I mean that the American left, like the Democratic Party, becomes like uh, the British Labor Party. We're not there yet, and I think it's very important to, to acknowledge that. The Democratic Party, the established Democratic Party, has not been taken over by the squad. I mean, you can look at any resolution on Israel, for example, that comes down the pike, and still the, an, a significant majority of Democratic members of Congress will vote for that pro-Israel resolution. So you couldn't say, if, if the Corbynization had completely had its way on the American left in the, in the, in the party, then you wouldn't be, you wouldn't, that wouldn't be the case anymore. So you've seen a diminution of support in the Democratic Party, and you can see it in the polls, by the way, as well. And I have polling data I could show you that, 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 that indicates that there's diminishing support on the left. But it hasn't gotten to the point where, where that's the majority sentiment. Um, when, when the squad was elected, um, one of the leading Democrats, Steny Hoyer, said, you guys are worried about this, and I understand it, but there, there's not four new members of Congress. There were 59 members of Congress, and 58 of them, I mean, and 55 of them, I think it was, or 52 of them, I just took to Israel on a, on a mission. So, you know, you can see that it's still not the dominant force within the Democratic Party, but that doesn't mean it won't be in the future. Yeah, and um, it's interesting to hear you speak about this um, this, this balance between the left and the right, which is probably not what I was thinking about when I first saw a picture of your book on, on, uh, on social media. Um, we've just had Jonathan Greenblatt here as the keynote speaker to our JNF appeal, but a couple of months ago, the Zionist Organization of America, the ZOA, criticized his Anti-Defamation League for its report on extremism in the USA, and it argued that it focused on white supremacism, but downplayed threats from minority extremists. Um, to me, that was an example of woke anti-Semitism. How do you read that? Um, I don't know if I'd call that woke anti-Semitism. I think that the ADL has, in recent years, seen a much bigger problem on the right than on the left. I think now they're starting to ask themselves, well, maybe they underestimated the problem on the left. Jonathan Greenblatt recently compared anti-Semitism on the right to a hurricane and anti-Semitism on the left to climate change. Um, I thought that was an apt comparison. Um, and um, that doesn't mean I'm, I think that I think that there are um, problems at the ADL that they have to take stock of. In fact, um, there was a report by Fox News this last last week about that the ADL has been teaching woke ideology in their programs. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I've, seen the, I've seen many examples of that. And in response, the ADL said, we are going to undertake uh, an internal review of all of our programs and know that some of what we've been teaching does not align with our traditional values. So the skeptic among you might say, well, they should have figured this out years ago, um, you know, and, and how dare you done X, Y, and Z. 
And the people like me, who are, tend to, you know, want to welcome everybody back into the fold, say, well, Zygazone, let's get this done. Let's see what your review comes up with. And, um, and we'd love to see the ADL be able to accurately diagnose what's happening on the lab and, um, and to cease programming and education that might actually fan the flames of that anti-Semitism. Yeah, and I suppose um, the skeptic that you just described would say, yes, well, you guys deliberately chose a, a particular path that was that was in line with your political views whereas you might say look they just got a little bit off the track and now they need to come back on track is that is that the way we would de describe it it's not a little bit off the track i just want to make it very clear when um when, when the adl programs that i saw i thought were egregious i'm not i'm not in any way suggesting that they just got a little bit off the crap track you know, ADL is a very large organization. It's an organization that raises tens of millions of dollars a year. So it's a complicated bureaucracy. And you have people at the ADL who probably, um, you know, uh, and I'm not saying probably, I know for a fact, are very, very uh, concerned about those uh, trends within their own organization. But it's a large bureaucracy and you have people in that bureaucracy who do the educational work, many of whom, you know, are quite woke themselves and are teaching this ideology to kids. And um, and so I think that's problematic. So I don't think that they're a little bit off track, but that doesn't mean that they can't take a look at what they've been teaching and say, well, we see now that this ideology that we've sort of unabashedly advocated for may be problematic and may be creating ideas of privilege that are coming back to haunt us. So let's go and, and take an honest look at this in reverse course. You know, I'm prepared to give them every opportunity to do that. Why wouldn't we want to give them an opportunity to fix it themselves? Yes. Um, you know, so, um, you know, I know that not everybody agrees with that. And there are people who say, we, you know, that, you know, they've already committed the, the crime. So let's, they deserve the punishment. Fine. I understand. But um, I, I, ADL is an important organization and I want it to function in the best way possible and to fix itself in the process. Okay, we've got, uh, I think we've got, uh, well, we've got just got a couple of hands up. If we can take very quickly, uh, I've got Victor and then Michael. So, Victor, please unmute yourself uh, and ask your question. And uh, But we are coming up to time, I notice. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for a very knowledgeable advice that you gave us. I've got a very simple question to you. Why most, most American Jews don't like, don't support Donald Trump? who did so much good for Israel as well as for America. Mm. Yeah. I don't want to get too partisan here. You know, a lot of people just think that Donald Trump is bad for our politics. I mean, that he's, he's, um, that, uh, that, and, and he can, and, you know, and, and if you're intellectually honest, you say he did amazing things for Israel. The Abraham Accords would not have happened without Donald Trump. I'm going to spend an all day program today and tomorrow on the Abraham Accords in Washington with, with ambassadors from Arab countries and others. So that's an a, a amazing accomplishment, but, but, um, but, you know, Donald Trump has also got some extreme tendencies um, himself and there are extremist forces that that are part of that larger right wing coalition that make us uneasy. And um, you know there are um, and 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 that also, by the way, inflames the situation on the left. The left inflames the situation on the right. You know, wokeism is is extremely offensive to many people, and they react by by becoming more right wing themselves. And and that right wing um, po political expression then. Um, then creates even more leftist expression. So I, I want to get out of that vicious cycle of the extreme right and the extreme left and go back to this uh, sort of a semblance of political normalcy where um, in, in this country. So I, I tend to um, not like either side, ex at least in its extreme form, very much. Okay, and we'll very quickly, we'll take Michael's question. So Michael, please unmute, unmute yourself and ask your question. Michael Webb, are you there? Okay, doesn't doesn't look like it. Um, just before we go, uh, um, David, uh, tell us wh when your book, when is your book going to be released, and how can we buy it? Thank you very much. Well, it's going to be released October eighteenth. Um, I, 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 can you can you all access Amazon.com? Can you get we books from Amazon? Certainly can. Okay, so you'll be it is on. Um, 
It is on Amazon. It will be on Amazon. You can get both the uh, um, both the soft cover book and the digital book. And I'm sure eventually it'll be on audio book. Uh, these days I listen to a lot of audio books. I don't know about you. Um, so um, yes, it's it's coming out. And I think it's good. You know, I, I'm, I'm confident that that people are starting to get the message. Uh, you know, increasingly I'm having meetings that one year ago, people wouldn't even meet with me to talk about these issues. And now I feel that people in the established Jewish community are starting to see the writing on the wall and they're they're meeting to discuss these trends. They're worried. They're privately worried, and I want to get them to be publicly worried. So I hope the book makes more people publicly worried in the Jewish community, and we start to see a shift in this dynamic. Yes, well, we hope it's very successful, and uh, and I'll, I'm looking forward to watching the movie when that comes out, David. So. Um, Look, David, thank you very much um, for your insights. Um, we've come up to time. Uh, very interesting how the way you explain things is probably a little different to, to us when we, we, we look at things through an Australian lens. So um, uh, it's just an interesting, uh, an interesting difference that, uh, that occurs between, between the, the two of us. I mean, by and large, we're very much on the same page, but just slight accents, if you like, that, uh, that make it a little bit different. So I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for getting up so early in the morning. And uh, we, look, we look forward to watching the progress of your book um, with great interest. So thank you, David Bernstein, for joining us. Oh, wow. It was wonderful to be with you. Thank you. That's all we have for tonight. Just before we go, the Lachaim program with Morris Klein is on, on right now, 3 Z. 3 at 3 triple z.com.au. Uh, that's all we have. Join us next week for our special event. It's a tribute to Izzy Liebler. Don't forget you can keep up to date with what AJA is talking about uh, by going to our Facebook page. Please like it and share it widely. But for now, we wish you all a very good evening and look forward to joining you next week as usual. So from me, it's good night to you all. Bye for now.